Hello, I'm Pastor Mark Biddy from Harvest Baptist Church in Dawsonville, Georgia. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for watching this YouTube video and invite you to our services here at the church. We're located at 123 John Perry Road, Dawsonville, Georgia. Our service times are Sunday morning, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, 11 o'clock morning worship, 6 o'clock evening worship. We also have a Wednesday midweek service where we meet at 7 o'clock for prayer, 7.30 for service. You can find more information about us on our website, www.harvest-baptistchurch.com. Again, thank you for watching this YouTube video. I hope it is an encouragement and a challenge to you. May the Lord bless you. So stand with me, if you will. Acts chapter number two. Let's begin reading verse number 41. Y'all just lay there, those. Thank you, fellas. Appreciate your help there. Acts chapter number two, verse number 41 is where we'll take our text. The Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men and as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come to you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. I thank you for Calvary. And Lord, thank you for the privilege of being here today. Thank you for all the testimonies, Lord, wonderful testimonies of your faithfulness and your goodness, and Lord, of your saving grace. And I thank you for that. Thank you for the good singing. Lord, now it's come time to get into your word. I pray that you'd feed us and help us through your word. I ask you, Lord, that you would help us as a church to go forward with one heart and one objective. And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for all you do now. Lord, if there's anyone in the sound of my voice that does not know you as their Savior, please, Lord, let today be the great day of salvation in their life. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Now, I wanted to begin today by, by saying something, kind of prefacing the message uh, by making myself clear on something. And that is this. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Uh, we are saved because of what Jesus did on Calvary, because of the blood he shed. We're saved because he did the work of atonement for us. And salvation is by and through Christ, and that is the only means of salvation. Now, last week I emphasized a good deal on the church. This week I will emphasize again on the church. And Lord willing, next week I'll emphasize again on the church. I hope last week I established the fact I love the church. I don't want there to ever be any doubt that I love the church, but I never want it to be portrayed that the, the church has some kind of saving ability because it does not. The church is made up of those who are saved by the grace of God. Uh, we are not saved through the church. Why would you take time to labor that point? Because there is one uh, particular large, massive religious group that puts the hope of the the hope of the person in the church and not in Christ. I don't want that to ever be the case, and I don't want anybody to ever uh, misunderstand what I'm saying. If I emphasize in the church, I'm emphasizing what God does through and in the church. Uh, but salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. And and uh, last week I mentioned some of the things that I have because of the church and some of the things the church means to me. And uh, I love the church as a whole. I love born again people. I love the body of believers. I, I love the local assembly, Harvest Baptist Church. I love this church. I love the, uh, the body of Christ that far extends beyond the walls of Harvest Baptist Church and beyond our membership into those who are saved by the grace of God. I love love the people of God. The dearest friends that I have in this world are saved people. 
And that's the way it ought to be. Amen. Uh, we have fellowship that, that I cannot have with other people. Uh, my family, thank the Lord, are saved and part of the church. And I'm glad that we can have uh, a likeness in our faith and in our believing. Uh, I'm, I'm trying in my mind and in my heart, I'm viewing this and I want to be able to portray that. Where would we be without the church? Where would our area be without the church? Where would we be in our lives? If you look back, if your life's anything similar to mine, you look back and the majority of the major things that have happened in your life have centered around the church. Uh, I look back, church has always been a part of my life. You may be a little bit different. Your uh, church life may have started uh, a little bit later. You may not have childhood growing up in church. You may not have the memories of the, the uh, awful green colored Sunday school class that I talked about last week. You may not have the memories of the Bible stories that you learned in a Sunday school class or in vacation Bible school. Your, uh, your time in church and your association with the church may have started later in life. But if you would be honest, you would look back and you'd have to say the church has played a vital role in your life, whether it began a week ago or whether it began many, many years ago as it did in my own life. I look back at Philadelphia and uh, I remember all of the great memories that I have of people and uh, dear saints of God that I love and, and still in my mind I can close my eyes and I can see uh, so many. Uh, Brother George Ward would have uh, sat just behind my grandfather and uh, over on the, the if you're walking down I'd be on the right side of the church brother George Ward uh, would be sitting there and he had that very deep deep bass voice and so when we were singing in the congregation and I would be sitting with Pa I could hear brother Ward right behind me that very deep deep voice singing the songs of Zion I remember I can go back in my mind to uh, a hospital room over at Gwinnett Medical Center I believe it was and uh, just before brother Ward went home to be with the Lord and uh, we were gathered there around the bedside and we had taken him a, a tape of a song uh, God is still on the throne I believe is the name of the song and he always loved that and uh, me and Jeremy were gathered around there and uh, I, I believe Holly and Mandy were both with us as well we were all there gathered around the bed he put that tape in he was he was deaf and could hardly hear he put on earphones and turned it all the way up I remember his arm arms were, uh, all of his joints were swelled with arthritis. His fingers were uh, mangled because of arthritis. And I remember very vividly as he began to sing, began to listen to that song. And uh, the, the chorus, would, would, it came into the chorus, and God is still on his throne. He will take care of his own. When he got to that part, uh, Brother, Brother Ward, because of the arthritis and because he was so weak, he couldn't raise both hands so he, he raised the one he could get up and, and, and then that wasn't good enough for him. He reached over and he grabbed his finger and he, he pulled the other hand up as he laid there in the bed and worshiped the Lord just days before he went home to be with the Lord. That's the type of memories I have of the people of God in church. I remember, uh, of course, my godly grandmother and grandfather, Pa, in his very faithful position. Amen. Didn't, uh, I don't remember him moving very often. That was his place in that seat. And uh, my grandmother on the other side of the church. And, and I grew up, uh, a lot of the ladies and men didn't sit together. Ladies sat on one side of the church and men sat on the other. And uh, we had segregated praying. You know, men couldn't touch heaven from one side of the church. They had to go to a specific place in the altar if they wanted to hear from heaven. And some of y'all have been there and the men prayed on one side of the church. The ladies prayed on the other side of the church. And uh, my grandparents never sat together that I remember. But I remember he was faithful over here and loved the Lord. And uh, my grandmother, she would have her songbook and she'd be singing along and checking everybody out as, as the service was going on. And, I mean, I've got wonderful memories of the people of God in church. Church has always played a very, very vital role in my life. And uh, as I think about that, I think about my own life. Where would I be without the church? Where would the world be without the church? Now we're going into the book of Acts and we're going back to a city called Jerusalem. Very familiar name, very familiar city. Most people have heard a lot about Jerusalem. Uh, there's a lot of discrepancy as far as the uh, amount of people that is believed to be alive during this time are living in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Uh, this would be just after the death of Christ. We're 
Uh, the Lord has just died and rose again, uh, very fresh on the mind of those who are following Christ now. We enter into the book of Acts, which is a transitional book. It's bringing us from the dispensation of the law to the dispensation of grace. There's going to be a lot happening through the book of Acts. And we're going to see the church begin to grow and flourish. And, and really, uh, the, the church's presence in the world is about to come real prevalent in Jerusalem. Uh, it was said, depending on the sources, and, and this is what you're going to laugh about, uh, uh, depending on sources, the population of Jerusalem during in this time uh, on the high end would have been 2.7 million on the low end 20,000 <laughs> I thought I said man somebody's got to bring it in closer to that uh, a lot as far as I studied much of the uh, much of uh, history would teach that there was somewhere upwards of a hundred thousand people or more give or, give or take some there about this time and uh, by the time 70 AD rolls around uh, and, and Titus is conquering Jerusalem then there's a lot of the population is gone because people have been dispersed abroad and many 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 thousands have been killed uh, during that time so uh, at this particular time we find the book of Acts. Well, let's just say there's 100,000 people, give or take some, in the city of Jerusalem. That is a, uh, it's not a large city, but it's much larger than Dahlonega. It's much larger than Dawsonville. And uh, so we're at a good size city. And now this new group of people have come on the scene and they're preaching something entirely different than what has been heard here in Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem has had this religious group called the Jews and the Pharisees and they they have been uh, telling them about the, the prophets and what the prophets said. And they've been telling them that, that uh, the Messiah is coming out in the future. He's coming. He's coming. They've been telling them, hey, sacrifice, keep the law, keep the sacraments, all of those types of things. Let's make sure that we uh, make sure we fulfill God's law so that we could obtain holiness. And now this new group of people comes on the scene and said, hey, it's not in the law. It's in Jesus Christ. And, and I'll be honest with you, it did not go over smoothly with this religious crowd. So there's an upheaval in the town of Jerusalem. We come to verse number 42. If you have a Schofield Bible, you'll see a little caption there from Schofield that says this is the first church. It's not the first use of the word church, but uh, the first is as far as an established gathering or called out assembly of people. And these church, this church is continually steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. So we've got a church going here in Jerusalem. Notice, if you will, the message that this church has. Chapter number two of the book of Acts is what we call the chapter of Pentecost. And uh, Peter is uh, giving this message. He's preaching a sermon. And uh, I want to point out just a few things that he preached because this is the message of the church in Acts chapter number two. And it's still the message of the church. These many years later, it's still what we're preaching today. Uh, number one, you'll see in the message of the church, he preached about the perfection of Christ. In chapter number two, verse number 22, the Bible said, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, listen to this next statement, a man approved of God. You realize what that one statement means? We're talking about the God of glory. We're talking about the God of holiness, the God of righteousness, the God of purity and perfection and, and uh, Peter comes out and he says hey I'm going to be preaching to you about Jesus Christ a man approved of God that means God in his holiness and righteousness has looked upon Christ in his humanity amen uh, don't forget as Christ was deity he was also humanity God in the flesh and, and as he was in the flesh he was absolutely perfect, not only in his deified part, but also in his human part. He was absolutely perfect. And God had looked at Christ. He's looked at him in and out. And he said, this man is approved of God. Remember what John would say uh, as, uh, G as Jesus came to be baptized, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And I've labored that before, so I'll just uh, throw it out there real quickly. They knew the requirements 
garments of the lamb. They knew the lamb had to be spotless. And when Jesus showed up, they said, that's the one. That's the one who has no blemish. That's the one who has absolutely spotless perfection before God. This man has been approved of God. So the message is we have a perfect Savior. Thank God we've got a perfect, in a world of failing men, in a world where society says there is no truth, in a world where society says there is no uh, standard to go by. We've got a Savior who is holy and pure and righteous and will never falter and never change. We have a perfect Savior. And so the message of the, of the church was that of a perfect Christ. And then we see all the perfection of Christ. We see in verse number 22, the performance of Christ. Peter is preaching about the Lord. And, and, and he says, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among, by, uh, among you by miracles and wonders and signs. He said, hey, we're not only preaching about a perfect Christ. We are preaching about a performing Christ. A Christ who is able to do something in the lives of those who follow him. I don't know if you're getting any help from this, but man, I'm telling you right now, Holy Ghost just swelled up in my heart just a little bit. I'm glad we don't have a dead God who cannot touch his people, but we've got one that can perform miracles and wonders. You say, I don't think I've ever seen God do a miracle. Then you've never been saved by the grace of God because when this old boy got saved, I was dead in trespasses and sins and he quickened me and made me alive in Christ and he turned me from death and into life. He turned me from darkness to light. I'm telling you I know what it is to experience a miracle working God. We have a miracle working God, a performing Christ. He is able to do things in the lives of those that will follow him. He touched blind eyes. He touched deaf ears. He touched dumb tongues. He touched weak legs. He, he, he raised the dead to walk again and to live again. I'm telling you, we have a miracle working Christ. And the message of the church is still the same today. He's not only a perfect Christ, he is a performing Christ. And that which he's done in the past in touching lives, he will still do today. He still longs to touch the lives of those who are weak and wounded. The message of the church and the perfection of Christ and the performance of Christ. The message of the church is found in the passion of Christ. Verse number 23, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. Is that not still the message today? We don't preach Jesus an example, we preach Him a Savior. Because a man who takes Christ as his example will still die and go to hell. But a man who takes him as his Savior will be saved. Amen. You say, well, if a man follows him as example, he'll be okay. Oh, no, no, no. You've got a lot of religious people that are trying to follow the example of Christ in the outward appearance of the flesh. They're trying to do good and they're trying to... Uh, promote humanity and everything. By the way, Jesus was a great humanitarian. He aided those around him. He loved those around him. But he didn't come to be a humanitarian. He didn't come to feed the hungry, although he did that. He didn't come just to teach. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Once a man has been saved by the grace of God, then he can follow the example of Christ. We have a Savior who was crucified and slain for the sins, not of his own, but for the sins of the whole world. And that is still the message of the gospel today. The message is this. We have a perfect Savior. He's a performing Savior and he still works out of his passion, his crucifixion, his love that led him to the cross of Calvary. We can't get away from him. He said, well, our kids don't need to hear about all those bloody and terrible things. Your kids need to see the Savior hanging on the cross. Your kids need to see the beaten and bloody and bruised Savior. Why? Because they're one of the, they're going to come through the Word of God and they're going to read where he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and they're going to need to know Oh, hey, those stripes that were laid upon him were laid upon him for them so that they could be born again. We don't hide the blood from our children. We don't hide the gory details of the crucifixion from our children. Why? Because that is the message of the church. Jesus Christ came and died for those who were guilty. The innocent slain for the guilty. It's the message of the church, the passion of Christ. And then he, he not only mentioned the passion of Christ, he preached about the power of Christ. 
Verse number 24, whom God hath raised up. Aren't you glad he didn't stay dead? I don't know if that's proper English, but it's real good preaching. I'm glad he didn't stay dead. I thank God that we serve a risen Savior. I bless the Lord that when we go to Calvary, we must go past Calvary to the garden tomb and we must realize the cross is empty, but thank God the tomb is empty as well. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I. Oh, wonderful, wonderful message the church has. And it's still the message today. And I want to ask you this question. Where would Jerusalem be without this message? Imagine Jerusalem without this message. 3,000 people are about to be saved at the end of this message. You know, he talked about giving an invitation. 3,000 people are about to get saved. After this message is completed daily, such as should be saved will be added to the church. I'm talking about this is an ongoing thing. People are getting saved day in and day out over and over and over. Where would Jerusalem be without the message of the church? Let me ask you this. Where would you be without the message of the church? Where would you be? I know not everybody here got saved in church. I understand that, but a lot of you did. Where would you be? If it wasn't for that old leather lung preacher that preached salvation to you. Y'all know my story, you know my testimony, you know my childhood, you know Brother Glendon Bennett. Uh, me and Brother Danny were talking about him yesterday just a little bit. And I've, all, I've often said this, Brother Glendon had a, a seven foot arm with a two foot finger. And when he'd preach, it didn't matter if he was standing in the pulpit or if he was back in the aisle somewhere. When he pointed that finger, it came all the way to your nose. And he'd tell me I was lost and needed to say, where would I be without the message of the church? Where would you be without the message of the church? We see not only the message, we see the method of the church is given here in the book of Acts. Notice our text, verse 42 of chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and, and had all things common. There's a, a message, a, there's a, a method of unity. But I want you to notice something uh, here, and I think this is what we miss sometimes. The church in the book of Acts met people where they were. Amen. I think sometimes we witness to people thinking they have an understanding of the gospel. So we can just jump in anywhere and they're going to understand. You know, we, we even now here in Georgia deal with people ha who have no idea what it means to be saved. You talk about are you saved? Saved from what? They, they don't understand what you mean. And we jump in and say, man, I'm telling you right now, they live in Georgia. They've got to have an understanding of who Jesus is and what the gospel is. And I can just jump in anywhere. Well, they didn't do that in the book of Acts. Peter says, I've got to find a launching place to get the gospel to these people. You know where he goes? He's talking to Jews. You know where he goes? He goes to the prophets. Notice verse number 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Then go down to verse number 25. He, he pulls out not only one of the prophets, he pulls out one of their heroes. All right, I've got to get the message of the gospel to these people. Where do I begin? Where do I meet these people at? I'm going to meet them with one of their heroic fi figures. For David, verse 25, for David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Uh, he goes back and he tells him, he said, hey, you go back to the writings of David. You go back to the book of Psalms. And there are things that David said that you're attributing to David. But David wasn't talking about David. That's what Peter's saying. He said, David wasn't talking about David. David was talking about Jesus. And David said that he would not allow uh, his, his, uh, what, let, me, let me find it there in verse number 27. Uh, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Uh, the Jews are saying, oh, that's talking about David. And David's going to live. He said, that's not talking about David. That's talking about Jesus. He goes back and he says, you know, David, I want to tell you what David preached. David preached that Jesus would die and rise again. The church met them where they were. You cannot go to a lost drunk man and expect him to understand your life when you got saved on the church pew. There's no way. Y'all are two different places. You're going to have to find him where he's at. 
You, you say, well, I've never been drunk. I know that. I understand that. Praise the Lord. You ought to thank God for that. Don't ever be ashamed of the fact you've never been drunk. Thank God you've never been drunk. I've never been drunk, and I praise the Lord for that. I used to be ashamed of that because I felt like you had to be a drunk in order to have a good testimony. I'm glad I got over that. Amen. He said, well, I, I don't know how to reach them. You know, the Bible is filled with broken people that Jesus touched. Why don't you go find one of them and tell them what Jesus did for them and then tell them what Jesus did for you. The, the early church met people where they were, but then I want you, want you to notice, turn with me to chapter number three. The early church met people's real needs. Now, I don't want to, get, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to step in on anybody's toes. I have no problem with food banks. Food bank, banks are great ministries. There are a lot of hungry people around, and I thank the Lord. I, I've got a dear friend, a pastor friend, that is running a food bank, and I mean, doing a great job, and they've had multitudes saved. But you understand, physical hunger is not the greatest need of a, of a person. I thank the Lord for closed closets. I do. We in Philadelphia, we had a closed closet type deal. And, and what we would do with missionaries and different ones, they had a, uh, we would give them a certain amount of points. And those points were like dollars. Everything had a, an amount on it. They could come through there and they could just shop. And they could get all kinds of supplies and clothes and everything. Else. That's wonderful. But clothes on a person's back is not their greatest need. Notice verse, chapter number three, verse number one. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asking alms. And Peter fastened his eyes on him uh, with John and said, Look on us. He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. This is a liberal's nightmare. Amen. You know why? They didn't offer him welfare. They offered him a working body. That's a liberal's nightmare. Amen. They didn't, they didn't offer to give the man a daily provision. They offered to give him healing so that he could live the rest of his life. Isn't that terrible? Who do they think they are? They could have given him a $10 bill. He could have went down there and he could have eaten like a king today. But instead, the real need was not a physical hunger. The real need was a physical touch. And he got the physical touch. He, he, he was touched with the hand of the Lord. He was healed and he began leaping and praising God. Can I say this? The church ought to focus on people's real needs. If you've got a food bank, if, you've got a, if there is a food bank, if we ever started a food bank, the emphasis of the food bank must be one primary goal and that is an opportunity to preach Jesus to them. Because you can give them a bag of food and they can go home happy for a night. But if you can get them the Savior, they can be happy every night from now on. They could die of physical hunger and still be full because they know Jesus. The early church's method was to meet people where they were and to meet their real needs. And then I want you to know the, the manners of the church. And I'll close and have some closing remarks here in just a moment. The, the, how did the church operate? What did they do in these early days? Number one, they had unction. They had a power from on high. They were preaching, they were teaching, they were uh, going from door to door, sharing the Word of God. They were uh, busy witnessing and reaching people day in and day out. This was not a Sunday activity for them. It was not three services a week. This was a daily activity for them, getting the gospel to the world, preaching and teaching and sharing uh, what the Lord had done for them and what the Lord could do for others. This was a daily activity. I don't, I don't know where it came about that Christianity was a Sunday event. But that's what society believes. 
I was reading an article today, actually had a lot of good things in that article about the, the church and, and, and what the church means to the world and, and why the world needs the church. And it was, it was really some good things, but, but there were some terrible things as well. Because the writer said this, he said, I may only go in on Sunday, and it may only be for an hour. And it, this is what he said, and it may not affect me for the rest of the week. But I needed that one hour. And I'm going, what do you mean it shouldn't affect you for the rest of the week or may not affect you for the rest of the week? Living for Jesus and being a Christian is a 24-hour-a-day event in the life of the believer. It's not something we do from time to time. You say, man, alive, I'm telling you, Saturday night, I better get some power on me so that we can go to church tomorrow. Wait a second, hold on, you messed up. You're not supposed to have power just to go to the house of God. You're supposed to have power every day of your life. The unction of God on you. And then they had unity. They were, uh, if there's ever been a unified group of people, it was that early church. If there's one strand that you will read throughout uh, the, the events of the early churches, they were all in unity. Let me, let me read uh, chapter 4, verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them the, that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. What do you think would be said of a church? where everybody shared the same heart, and that was the heart of the Lord. Where great grace was upon everyone. And where every time somebody got in the pulpit to preach or, uh, or in a Sunday school class to teach, every one of them had the power of God on them. You not imagine that'd be a much different church than what many people went to today? Now I'm going to ask you, what would Jerusalem be and where would Jerusalem be without this church? Can you imagine just the 3,000 people that got saved there at Pentecost? Where would they be without this message? Lost. They'd be in hell today. All those that were daily added to the church, where would they be without the church and the message of the church and the method of the church and the manners of the church? Where would they be? But again, the more important question, where would you be without the church? And this is a question I want to ask. Where would Dawsonville be? You say, well, Harvest Baptist Church is just a church on the side of the road. Not for everybody, it's not. It's not just a church on the side of the road for me. This place is special. It's not just another building that you pass by. Oh, no, not to me. This place is special. I got a call this morning. First thing I, I guess I got here about a little bit before seven, um, been here maybe, so right around seven o'clock this morning, the phone rang here at the church. I answered the phone, it was a recording from a jail, a local jail. And it said, this is a prepaid call from a local jail, blah, 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 blah. I'm not gonna give any names out. As the phone, it clicked over, said, you may now talk. I said, hello. And it was a, a young lady that I've dealt with many, many times. Me and Mandy have spent a lot of time with her and. Um, trying to help her. And this was her words as she was weeping and broken. She said, Brother Mark, she said, I'm ready to come home to my church. Now, I'm going to ask you something, okay? I, I understand you say, well, she, don't, she needs to come to Jesus. I know what she needs. But you know what she associates? There are a multitude of churches in the county where she's in jail, in Dawson County, in Lumpkin County, Pickens County, White County, you, you name it. There are churches all over the place. But for that one young lady, her church, her place of, of, of spirituality in her life is Harvest Baptist Church. Last week we had a young lady come in. She, she asked to see me. We sat down, me and Mandy sat down with her. 
in uh, after service last Sunday and she told me I, I told her I said well, first I want to thank you for coming here there's a lot of places you could have gone and she said no you don't understand there's only one place I would ever go and that's Harvest Baptist Church I understand to a lot of people going up and down the road it's just another building but not to everybody for some place for some people this is a lifeline this is their place of hope. This is where they met Jesus. This is where they heard about Him. And this is the one place they know they can go and still get in touch with the Lord. And I, for one, don't want that to ever change. I want Harvest Baptist Church to be a beacon and a lighthouse for wayward people to come get right with God. It was, goodness, six weeks ago. A family I'd talked to before, maybe had only been to church here one time. Their, their family uh, had gone through a, just a, a terrible series of events and they were broken and wounded. And they came in, they asked if they could talk to me. I sat down with them for probably an hour or, or longer. And I, I told them the same thing. I said, I want to thank y'all for coming here. Y'all could have went a lot of places. They, they, they've never been a member here. I'm technically not their pastor, but this is what they said. Well, we never considered going anywhere else. This is the church where our kids went. This is the church we came to. And this is what she said. And she said, you're the only pastor we've ever known. Have they been back? Nope, not a single time in about six, eight weeks. Not a single time. Does that aggravate you? You better believe it aggravates me. But it still helps me to know for those people there's only one place they'd consider going when they need help from God. And they're still treating it like a crutch. I, I hope one day they'll get in and really get help from the Lord get saved. Right now it's just a crutch when they're limping. But I do thank God they at least associate Harvest Baptist Church with a place they can get help. I bless the Lord for that. One night years ago, I was standing in the foyer and a family came in. I'd never met them before in my life. Never seen them. He said, my son's up at the house and he's got a knife and he's threatening to kill himself and we don't know what to do. I said, come on, Brother Ken. We, we got a visit to make. I went up there and tried to talk to the guy. He tried to cut his wrist while I was there and I, I grabbed him and held him. He said he had a gun in his pocket and threatened to shoot me. And uh, we let him go, called the police. We couldn't help him. He was in no shape to be helped. I came back in. I had blood all over my shirt. Mandy's eyes about that. Bird. She said, what happened? I said, it ain't mine, honey. Don't worry. He said, is that a blessing? You better believe it's a blessing to me. You know why? Because they drove by a church to get to this church because they felt like this church was where they needed to go to get some help. It was important to those people. I haven't seen them since then. They don't come to church here. I got a phone call, uh, and, and I'm just going through, I'm, I'm trying to point out the importance of this church being right here. I got a call probably a year ago. Ted Bearden from the funeral home called me. He said, Brother Mark, um, I've got this family, and... Uh, they, they want you to come preach a funeral. And I said, tell me the family's name again. They told me, I had no idea who it was. And um, I said, well, Brother Ted, I'll be glad to help out, but I have no idea who they are. Well, he said, hang on, I got some notes here. They said, this is the sister of the niece of the, I mean, he went through a long line of how they traced it back to, to me and to the church. They wanted me to preach the funeral. Had no idea who they were. I went down and preached a funeral for someone I had never met for a family that I did not know just because. This is what they said. We didn't know who else to call. We've never had a church and we've never had a pastor. And in a time of need, we didn't know who else to call. So does that aggravate you? Sure, it aggravates me. Is that the role of the church? No, that's not the role of the church. But they needed somebody. And at that moment in time, 
Harvest Baptist Church meant the world to those people. I may never get to reach them again. I may never get to see them again. I may never, may never get to minister to them again in any way, shape, or form. But I did that day. And I got to give them the gospel. And I got to tell them there was somebody that loved them and cared about them that day. And that day, Harvest Baptist Church meant the world to them. Two years ago, family pulled in. We were the last one. In fact, I was in the car about to pull out. And they flagged me down in the driveway. And said, can we talk to you? We brought them in. I talked to them probably two, two and a half hours. Went and visited them three, four days after that. Had not, have not seen them in two years. My phone rang the other day. I said, Brother Mark, had a family member die. And I was wondering if you'd do the memorial service. I'm going to be honest with you. That's not the role of Harvest Baptist Church. We've got a lot more to do than just do memorial services. But you know what? For that one lady, it meant the world to have someone to call, somewhere to go in time of need. You say, well, harvest don't mean much. If harvest goes away or if harvest, uh, you know, if it just dissipates, it, it doesn't mean much. It does to somebody. I, for one, it means the world to me. This is my church. And I mean that as a member. This is my church. This is where I belong. This is where my membership is. And I love my church. And I bless the Lord for it. I'm Pastor Mark Biddy, And I would like to thank you for watching our live stream services today. We would also like to invite you to visit with us in our church. But before you go, there are a few things we'd really like for you to know. One, the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's every man, woman, boy, and girl at some point in time has sinned in their life and we were born in sin. Because of that, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. But that's not all the Word of God says. The good news is that same verse goes on to tell us, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Romans 5, 8, the Word of God says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the good news today is, you can accept Christ right now as your Savior. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We also know that the Bible tells us Jesus is given an open invitation. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. That is the invitation from Christ Himself. Thank you again for watching our live stream services. We look forward to ministering to you again in the near future. May the Lord bless you.